All right. Today, I'm super excited. I have a bit of a celebrity, I guess you would say, oh, in the <laughs> cybersecurity <laughs> strategy area. Uh, Morgan Wright. Now, come on. You've been on what? Fox News, Fox Business, PBS, CBS, CNN, ABC News. And yes, I am reading off of your website because I have terrible short-term memory. <laughs> I, I was uh, fortunate to um, get involved during the big denial of service attack back in February of 2000. Mm. My team, we had figured out how to trace these attacks back, and we just happened to serendipitously put out a press release that morning saying we knew how to uh, you, you know, trace these attacks back and uh, solve for them. Been sharing this information with the FBI, and then guess what happens that afternoon? Mafia boy from Canada takes down CNN, takes down NPR, takes down Yahoo, takes down Amazon. So we were, so what did you know and when did you know it? So we got called before Congress a few times. Oh, that's awesome. And from my understanding, you also worked the love bug. Yeah, um, my team, we actually, um, one of the things we looked at too is we, uh, that was um, our analysis of it and some of the work we did was actually included in um, some of the reports uh, from uh, OMB and some other ones on proper ways to, we were looking at, even back then, this is 2000, 2001, right. we're looking at threat intelligence, you know, back then, what can we, what do we know, what do we know about the trade craft? Actually, one of the people on my team actually came out of the CIA, had done profiling work, uh, behavior analysis, and I used to teach behavior analysis um, interview and interrogation behavior analysis. I actually taught at the National Security Agency, the National Cryptologic School. So this was all very fascinating. It was the intersection of people and technology. And how can we figure out stuff about them? How could, everybody has tradecraft. Everybody has things that they do, even online. How can we trace back all of these Chinese hackers and Russian hackers? Because they have patterns of activity. In fact, uh, real quick story. One of the great ways they broke some of the Enigma code and some of the German code during World War II Hmm. is when they were starting to look at messages, you look at traffic analysis and you want to look for patterns. And they started realizing, what does every German basically say uh, after saluting and everything? It was Heil Hitler. So they started oh. realizing at the end of every message was Heil Hitler, and they were able to use that to do uh, cryptanalysis and actually break the code faster because every message ended in Heil Hitler. I love that. I love that. And I hate talking about how we were talking about things before the show, but that <laughs> reminds me just of that. We were discussing a, a, another case of a previous guest we had on, yep. uh, John Fitzgerald, and he broke the Unabomber, and he was brought down because of his arrogance and pride. Well, the Germans were so proud of Hitler, and it was so important to him to drive that message home. Yep. I guess that was kind of his undoing. Uh, that and ego, and actually a good friend of mine, Bill Tafoya, was an FBI profiler. He was one of the very few people, in fact, I think the only profiler that got the actual profile right in terms of not somebody who was blue, they thought he was blue collared, you know, That's had right. access to all this stuff. He was actually trained in the hard sciences. You know, Kaczynski was a mathematician. Right. And uh, and he was a prodigy, obviously taught at Harvard and got involved in some weird stuff uh, up there just from a experiment standpoint. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, he was. Um, so when they started looking at things and to your point, it was the MK precision. Ultra. He was. Yeah. MK Ultra. Ultra. Yep. And it was it was the precision, not only in his language, but it was the precision in, in learning from how he was building these bombs, how ornate they were, how intricate they were in the things. There's a great series on Netflix, too, on um, the Unabomber. And you actually it's the only recorded interview of Ted Kaczynski. He w talked with a reporter. And it is mm. very interesting to listen to his discussion with this reporter on what he did. Dude shows no remorse at all. He laughs about stuff. He kind of jokes. Um, and that's the scary part. Uh, no remorse. You know, the the funny thing with him, and I've, I've had other people on, there's some speculation, I'm not going to act like I'm an expert, I've just heard it, that autism and psychopathy are not completely different. Obviously, huh. they both lack empathy, and I'm not saying, you know, right. either one is necessarily evil, but I almost feel like he may be on the autistic spectrum of that oh, and just not feeling absolutely. anything for anybody, almost robotic. Does that make sense? No, absolutely. When you when you watch this series, it really delves into They talk with his brother a lot, David Kaczynski, and they talk about growing up and what things were like and how he changed. And you're absolutely right. We didn't have words. There was no such thing as ADHD back then. There was really mm -hmm. no things about autism back then. What you just had were behavior uh, observations, behavioral observations. And But he definitely, yeah, he obviously he's a savant, you know, his his gift, he was gifted. Mm -hmm. um, and But to your point, yeah, he was uh, totally lacked uh, any kind of empathy, um, was totally had no affect for anybody. I mean, he could probably watch you get run over by a truck and just go, hmm, you know, and then move on. 
Right. And and then you uh, pump a ton of LSD into him and <laughs> in the 60s. And, mm, you know, that might have uh, helped move things on a little bit. Yeah. Timothy, well, who's it? Timothy Leary talked about, you know, uh, taking trips in LSD. And then, you know, we could get into conspiracies and say, is it Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds or is it LSD? You know, one of the great uh, mysteries of songwriting of all time. Well, we can go back to what was it? Joe Rogan was talking about Santa Claus. And um, the deer actually being high on a particular route that gets them. Anyway. <laughs> and then along. there's Puff the Magic Dragon, Peter, Paul, and Mary. So let's, yeah, we could go <laughs> off on a tangent. This is not the Christopher Lockhead show. We're not going to dive too far off on a tangent. So uh, I've been on. I love Chris. <laughs> <laughs> now, I want to reach back, though, because you said my yep. team, my team. Now, lo looking into the, the research I've done on you, and I've done about 10 hours or so listening to interviews and things like that. What I hear is you were a cop, you were a state cop, then somehow you were at Cisco, all tell Lucian. But I feel like there's kind of a nebulous period. So in 2000, you said, my team. Who's your team? What was that all about? So um, I, had, uh, I, I had about 18 years in law enforcement, and quite frankly, um, you, you get to that point where it was really tough work. I was a detective. Um, the pay sucked. The hours sucked. Sure. And you kind of had to make a decision, right? Do, 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 do you go blow your brains out? Do you, do you do something else? And so um, I've had way too many friends. Uh, I've had more friends die from suicide than line of duty deaths. Wow. So, uh, yeah, that was pretty unnerving. So uh, so you have to make some decisions. So I was doing a lot of stuff with computers. Actually, Microsoft was one of my first very big clients. I did all of their online technical investigations. In fact, uh, point of pride here, uh, the very first judgment that Microsoft got against an internet uploader of pirated software. Yours truly did the entire technical investigation for Microsoft for Preston Gates and Ellis, which was the outside law firm, by the way. Uh, Gates is Bill Gates Sr. Uh, Bill Gates' dad right. uh, ran the law firm. And uh, so we actually got the first internet uh, judgment against an internet uploader of software. Well, that put me on some radar for some companies. Uh, I had some interviews with Ernst & Lung, but it was SAIC, Science Applications International Corporation. Mm -hmm. They were a big defense contractor. In fact, their claim to fame, uh, Dr. Bob Beister, the original CEO, one of the founders, uh, they did. They made their uh, initial foray into this field doing simulations of nuclear blasts. That's how SAIC got started. They were out in La Jolla, California, and did all this work. So anyway, but they became a big defense contractor. Well, information security at that time started becoming bigger. So I came out to lead a team of uh, incident response teams. And then that morphed into looking at the original threat intelligence. We were getting that information. Was the private industry with SAIC or yeah. now, SAIC. Okay. So when you were a cop though, you said, okay, you were a cop. Then you were at Microsoft. I mean, did you go to school or were you like me? I, I was in the army and had Ooh, put... sir. six <laughs> years in the reserves. Yeah. Oh yeah, whatever. <laughs> I was just a sergeant, but um, I, I fixed PowerPoint slides, and because I fixed PowerPoint <laughs> slides, that meant I knew everything about computers. You knew how to turn on the computer, yeah. So it was funny. So um, when I was a state trooper, I was actually, I tell people I was actually quite lazy as a state trooper. I wanted to find the most efficient way to do something so I wouldn't have to work so hard doing it. Right. And one of the most complicated things we did during accident reconstruction was doing. Um, conservation of linear momentum or uh, energy crush. Uh, so de deriving the speed based on the crush, mm. understanding the coefficient of stiffness of metals, and that would translate into the amount of energy. Energy would translate into momentum and velocity, which we could then determine what was the speed. Well, those are, in those days with a Texas instrument calculator, okay. you know, or doing it by hand, if you changed one variable, it would take you, you, know, you might spend 15, 20 minutes and rework in the whole formula. So I had gotten a Tandy 1000 SL, and uh, DOS, you know, I think it was uh, 3.3 at that time or, you know, whatever it was. And then um, uh, just it was I started learning how to program in basic. So I learned to wrote a couple programs on okay. conservation. Of linear. So anyway, long story short, that ended up getting into um, uh, understanding computer crime investigation. I went to my first computer crime investigation course in 1993. And uh, from there, I ended up being on the board of an organization called the International Association of Computer Investigative Specialists. By the way, cops were the original ones, us computer crime guys, were the original ones that started the whole electronic discovery uh, industry that's going on with legal firms and with uh, all these other folks that go in and they do electronic discovery. The Enron case, you know, when they say, hey, we want to search your computer. We were the first guys doing this because we were seizing computers and having to image them and analyze them and retrieve deleted emails and retrieve deleted files. So cops actually started the whole electronic discovery industry. And then they obviously took we had guys that uh, left and went and made tons of money, you know, by starting up companies to do exactly that. So 
that got me on the radar of these companies. So uh, SCIC was a private company, but they did, but they did a lot of work in the defense, uh, the intelligence community. And, but we had some of the really largest banks in the world. And so we stood up the first, what was called Information Sharing Analysis Center, the Financial Services ISAC. And it was under uh, Clinton's Presidential Decision Directive 63 that says, you guys, you in critical infrastructure has got to get together and you just got to start working on sharing information. So the financial services industry was the first one to do it. And we were working some big intrusions and big cases with some of the biggest names at that time in banking. That's and that's it. how so this then all the got FBI started. would get involved because... The company would have you guys investigating, but then there would be a criminal investigation. So you would start, I'm guessing, intermingling with the federal organizations. We'd, uh, we, you know, we'd liaise as appropriately or provide information. But a lot of times, a lot of times, these banks, um, when something happened to, there wasn't the the FBI at that time. This is 2000. Did not have a computer crime investigation. They had no capability at that time. In fact, I spent a year. One of the things I did in between when I left law enforcement and ended up out in Virginia, I spent a year going around and training the FBI CART team on how to conduct internet investigations. What so, is CART? Oh, I'm sorry, the computer. Uh, sorry, everything. <laughs> Too many acronyms That's out okay. here in Northern Virginia. <laughs> the Computer Analysis Response Team. So it's the, it's the FBI's um, computer crime investigative capability, and they called it CART back in those days. I think it's still called CART, but those were the folks. Those are the folks who come in and seize computers. Now they seize phones. Now um, they seize you know evidence in criminal cases. Well, there was no capability at that time, so we ended up doing a lot of the work. And then um, if the client elected to turn it over, that's what they would do. But we were brought in as a private. Uh, resource for them to understand what happened, to recover from the uh, breach, uh, to rebuild their defenses and get them back online. Sounds fun. Sounds like you hit that particular window of time when that specific skill set was needed and you just sort of adapted as you went. Yeah. And you know, what was interesting is um, nobody was really doing this kind of stuff. We were learning as we, it's like building a plane in flight. We're just figuring it out as we go along, you know, there were some rules of the road. We knew we had to do certain things away, but nobody had ever understood about what a really distributed denial of service attack was and how to really understand when the tipping point for that is, when somebody's going to have to unleash all of that before you would start detecting it and eradicating it before they could have this entire, you know, army of bots at that time, you know, ready to unleash this denial of service attack. So we learned a, we learned a lot as we go. And that actually, that's kind of that technical piece, the intersection between the investigative capability um, you know, cause during this time too, I also, uh, one of my other specialties was, uh, interview and interrogation behavior analysis. I'd went through mm -hmm. serial crime profiling with the, uh, FBI's behavioral science unit. They put on a course, uh, for dealing with what they call VICAP violent criminal apprehension program. I was one of the first people to go through that. So I was always fascinated with the human element of it, but, but now you're bringing technology into it. So how can we, how can we blend the two of these things together and really understand what are the, what are the mission problems we can solve through the deliberate application of technology. So that's where I focused on. That's what got me into training out at the NSA. That's what got me to do the FBI. Um, that's what got me into some other uh, things before 9-11 down in Plan, Bogota, or Plan Columbia and Bogota and after 9-11 in the intelligence community. There were some neat things that came out of that. Like you say, it was the right time, right place, that intersection of uh, people and uh, bad guys and technology. Well, we And it's always been that way. I mean, obviously, you know, Kevin Mitnick, Actually, I have I have photographs. Kevin Mitnick is a buddy of mine. I actually uh, uh, him and I did a video together for a client. And actually, two of the FBI people I trained during this one time when I was part of this organization, uh, the FBI used to send their cart team. Two of those folks were uh, two of the agents that caught Kevin Mitnick. Oh, fantastic. You know, I will be uh, talking to you afterward for contact information. <laughs> but Kevin Mitnick was a social engineer. He was Even he was more, more of a social engineer than he was technical. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And and most of the brilliant ones are. I mean, it from what I've seen, and I work in computers to a point, um, database engineering and all that, web programming, but it's a um, red hat, blue hat is yep. all about getting through people. How can I get past somebody? How can I get into the facility? If I can get in the facility, I can own you. So here's here's the deal I made with Microsoft one time because they told me one time, they said, well, we'll meet you on the second floor. I said, well, I'll, I'll just meet you there. They said, no, we have to come down and get you because our building is highly secure. Long Corporate Affairs Building 8 is the building Bill Gates was in. And I mm. said, I'll tell you what, I'll meet you up there. And if I can get in, you'll double the invoice. They go, oh yeah, sure, right. I said, <laughs> well, well, let's try. So one of the things I had learned, and this came from, I, I can't tell you where it came from, but let's just put it right. this way. Some um, associations I had, we were helping people understand how to really 
break in and do things. And so one of the things I carried with me where I carried different styles of badges and badge pulleys mm-hmm. and lanyards and things like that. And what I did is I sat back and I watched for 10 minutes and I watched every Microsoft employee that came in where they went for their badge, what it was looked like. Was it portrait? Was it landscape? You know, where, what mm-hmm. side was the picture on? And then all I did was wait until somebody started going through. I started to pull. They they reached up. They got it because I was pretending like I was going to get mine. I said, oh, I'm sorry, here. And I let the badge snap back. And I said, let me get the door for you. I opened the door, and then I walked in right behind them, acted like I was there because I listened to how they talked. I listened to what they did. I kind of dressed the part, too. And I met them in the conference room on the second floor. Now, long story short is they never doubled my invoice, which I didn't think oh, they were going to do. So That's not cool. But, yeah, the smoking area is one of the best places for that, too, by the way. Um, Bill, yeah, I, I never smoked, but, uh, yeah, but back, back when they were having smoking and stuff, but all you do is you sit back and you watch people. And here's the the real trick. If you don't act like you're nervous, if you just act like you belong there and it's no big thing and you walk in, Hey, let me get the door for you. Fine. That takes people off their guard. It's the people who go, uh, uh, can I follow you in? Uh, Hey dude, uh, can I get some more of that toilet paper? You know, those are the folks that wonder who the heck you are and that's what raises. But if you just act like it's no big deal and you belong there and you just own your little space, uh, Social engineering is one of the most effective tools, and it is still used out there. Wow. And, you know, yeah. it, it's used in phishing and spear phishing emails. In fact, spear phishing emails are the number one tactic used by the Chinese and the Russians to uh, get the initial foothold inside systems for uh, for a breach. We, I, I want to talk about that, too, because I think some of this is coming up. Another one that was fun for a while, but it's kind of gone away because they were all in IP telephony and things like that. But if you were the phone guy or could really pull off being the phone guy, everybody was terrified of the phone guy and everybody was afraid that their phone would be messed up or it would never yep. get fixed. And most phone guys were surly. So it was almost <laughs> a perfect way to get into any building, at least in the 90s, was just be the phone guy. And they were so happy. And, oh, my God, you finally showed up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could always bet that there was a problem because it was all copper wire and, and old switches and something was breaking down. So you, know, you have to say, hey, I'm here to fix, you know, you guys got a problem with your switch. Oh, we do? Yeah. And you throw out some language at them. They go, whatever. Yeah, just fix us. I'm sure we have a problem. You know, yeah, I got to get in the stupid closet, man. Yeah. Look. I, oh, I let me a... unlock it for you. Click. There you go. Right, yeah. yeah. I, I'll, you know what? I'll come back tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so... But um, yeah, let's go into spear phishing because right now we're under obviously, well, I've never seen anything like this, and that includes nine eleven, the yep. whole COVID nineteen coronavirus, whatever. But I feel like this is also the prime opportunity for scams. Absolutely is. Yep. And I had Jerry Williams, um, FBI agent, on doing a live stream, and she pointed out that one of the main scams that you've got to watch out for right now is have you lost your job and are waiting for insurance benefits and there'll be some emails and things going out on that front or actual physical mails what do you see happening oh uh, so one of the roles i have right now is i'm chief security advisor for a uh, uh a very advanced cybersecurity company called sentinel one uh and i said i'm not here to pitch anything because i'm not i mean that's that's what i do and the sure. reason i know but the reason I'm involved with them is we're trying to elevate their profile. They just raised $200 million. They're now a $1.2 billion valuation company. But they do some really neat things with artificial intelligence, with machine learning to actually respond to these attacks in real time. And one of the things I've actually been interviewed a lot. Now I've written some blogs. Uh, we did a webinar. And one of one of the blogs I wrote was defending against the psychology of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And it was mm-hmm. exactly directed at this. We've seen um, the, just the number of domains within seven days that were registered that had corona, coronavirus, COVID in the name. I mean, it was just, a, you know, a 10,000% increase in the number of domains. We've seen a 400% increase in the number of uh, phishing and spear phishing emails and, sp- you know, basically scam emails that have gone out. And a lot of what they do is, look, if, if I told you, I said, hey, look, um, I'm going to send you these three pills, take them, take three pills a day. And in six months, you're going to be buff like me. Ah, well, you know, whatever. But if I sent right. you an email, though, that said, hey, guess what? Where you work at, we've identified two of your coworkers had COVID-19. It's imperative that you register and get your information into the system now. Click here in that link. Guess what? That's the preying on sense of urgency, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And actually, it's very analogous to one of the ways when I did uh, interviews and interrogations. There's two pieces. There's the interview, fact collecting, mm-hmm. interrogations, develop a theme. And the whole purpose of interrogation is is once once you've established a set of facts that this person is either involved or has information about the case, you go into the interrogation. It's designed to create anxiety where the only way for them to get that anxiety out 
is to tell the truth or is to take an action like telling the truth. That's exactly what these scammers do. They manifest, they get you to manifest anxiety, stress. Oh my God, people are dying. This You've got to do your part. Here's a here's an email from the, and this is a legitimate one too. I mean, a, not a legitimate. Here's a real one that happened, came out of Canada. You know, hey, the health minister of Canada says, you've got to do this. Here's the steps you need to take. Click here to get this document. What's everybody doing? Clicking on the link just, you know, because somebody told them to, because they're scared, because they're saying, I have all this anxiety. The way to get rid of it is I need some information. This link has this information for me. Therefore, I'm going to click on it so I can get the information so I can reduce my anxiety and my stress level. And guess what? That's the that. And actually, that particular email was a banking Trojan. It was malware hidden inside. And it was a banking it Trojan. Yeah. Well, and I, I get so frustrated because... I probably go to the ultimate extreme. I refuse to click links and emails at all. So if you send me something like uh, my fill in the blank name bank, oh, okay, oh, I will then huh. go to their website and I will log in and say, funny, <clears throat> nothing here, delete. Um, I was actually very frustrated though because Twitter actually sent me an email with a link to change my password and it pissed me off because I went to Twitter and when I went to log in, sure enough, I had to change it, but I'm like, are you kidding me? You, I, because I, I won't know. click in an email. They should have just flat out said, come to the site and change your password. Go back to your trusted site, log in, and when you do it, it'll pop up and it'll say to change your trust. Are these folks tone deaf? I mean, this is this. And let me tell you, while I'm off on just a quick rant here, all of you people on Facebook that are sending me e messages or other stuff say, important, you got to share this with everybody. You know, first of all, that's the first thing that says Team I'm letter. nuking you off of my list. Yeah, you're not getting there. You want to send me something funny that's not appropriate to put in Facebook? I'm with you all over the place. <laughs> but do not send me the stuff. Oh, you, you have to listen to this. This guy is right. You know, no, 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 no. This, this stuff gets nuked. You get on my do not call list. I ban you. You know, I block you. I just, I, you know, we cannot fall victim to this. And people say, well, I don't understand this technology. It's not technology. If somebody walked up to your door and they say, hey, I need to look at your checkbook and your checks to see if you've got enough money to pay your house payment next month. Are you going to let a total stranger in your house to go rifling through your house to look at your credit cards, your driver's license, your social security number? Then why the hell would you let somebody online do the exact same thing? But yet, why does the Nigerian prince scam work? Because people still fall for it. Why do they keep sending the emails? Because people st name me one person, and I have a million dollar bet. Name me one person <laughs> who has gotten rich from clicking on a link in an email that promises them a million dollars in money. I have yet. If it worked, we'd have stories about it. It doesn't work, folks. It's an easy bet, but um, there was actually a really cool study done by Microsoft uh, when they were doing the data intelligence on why the Nigerian scammers do it like they do. Because you notice that there are not only bogus messages, but they're riddled with typos, mm -hmm. English not being the first language, and they're just horribly written. That's actually a feature. Mm -hmm. They do that deliberately because only, I, it's really rude to say, but only the really gullible people will actually follow that path. So yep. they're self-selecting. Absolutely. It's starting. And right now, look, I've got a scam going on. So if you guys are involved in this scam against me, don't listen. But I actually got an email that says, are you the right Morgan Wright? Because we have a business proposal for you. And of course, I said, okay, let me screw with these guys. So I've been going on for two weeks now of this company. One company is supposed to be a consulting company right here in DC. I mean, I know the place where these guys are. I said, well, why not just drop by your office? Oh, well, no, no, it's better that we do this first. So there's the clue. So they're trying to get me to buy steel at a profit margin and they will source it from a company called Hong Kong Steel. So I just went and did some simple stuff, like I traced where the domain name came from. I did a trace route. So one place is in Russia. The other place is in Greece. Neither one of them are in D.C. or Russia or Hong sure. Kong like they say they are. But you know what? But, but to your point, they go to an elaborate ruse. They've actually set up – if you go to the website, it looks like a website. We do steel mm -hmm. importing. Or we do consulting. They actually got the domain. Now, anytime you're in business and you send me to an MSN or a Yahoo or a, a God forbid, an AOL account, in right. addition to, you know, obviously it's a scam. But I've been, I've been, been sucking these guys along for a couple of weeks because I want to see what their scam is. You know, I'm, I'm looking at what they do um, and what I'd love to do, which I won't do because my ethics would prohibit, prohibit me from doing this. But there was a guy in France who got tired of these scammers. So they were trying to get him to uh, send information about his business and stuff. So he sent them a PDF that said, is this, I did a screenshot. Is this what you're looking for? Well, the screenshot had uh, ransomware embedded inside there and they locked down their entire operation. <laughs> One for yeah. the good guys. Well, uh, that would be fun. I do know that some people have written some uh, 
programs, and we'll have to talk a minute about AI here in a second, Yeah, um, which is essentially machine learning. And it was a deliberate program that would just continuously tie them up and reply to their letters. So there, and I believe that was the same study at Microsoft. So it, it would deliberately retrieve it and stall them and take yeah. all the time and just eat as much physical time as possible from them. Now you mentioned AI before, and mm -hmm. if you uh, are around Chris at all, you know that we're all huge fans of Grumpy Old Geeks with Jason yep. DeFilippo and Brian Schulmeister. And AI is, um, shall we say almost a trigger word or triggering because Everything that's being called AI, for the most part, is not AI. No. It's machine learning. It's machine learning. And people don't understand the relationship between machine learning and what AI does. So, you know, machine learning is really about learning about how things, it's to make something smarter. But the AI, the algorithm is really, it takes, it, it can take machine learning, it can take other things, and then be able to, so there's, there's, um, there's basically what they call weak AI, you know, but uh, but mm -hmm. if we ever get to the point where we have, uh, you know, basically general artificial intelligence to where we get to that point to where it, it can actually think for itself and it can actually do for it. We are like 20 to 30 years away from having that mm -hmm. kind of AI. Right now we have narrow AI. You know, we have things that can respond to certain things. But, yeah, you're right. Everybody looks at machine learning. They go, that's AI. No. That's the material that makes AI smart, but machine learning is is just one of several constructs that feed into the bigger algorithm of you know of artificial intelligence for be able to do that. But yeah, but you know what? But that's the danger in this society. We get so many buzzwords going, and when mm -hmm. I hear certain words being used incorrectly, for example, we talked about crime earlier. Mm -hmm. There is a difference between a robbery and a burglary. Nobody robbed. You cannot rob a house. You can True. burgle a house. You mm -hmm. rob people, people get robbed, places get burgled. But, but we've, you know, we've grown to say, but so, but that's the problem. Words mean things so that when words are used incorrectly, you have a perception. And that's why people fall victim to a lot of these scams. They get in their mind a perception that it's supposed to be a certain way. And when they hear that word, they go, oh, must be true because they said, you know, my house got robbed. Oh, help me with that one, by the way, another one, assault and battery. From one percent, assault is the threat of the threat of the thing happening yeah. and then battery is the actual contact. You can actually, you so you could actually have an assault and battery if they were separated in time. In other words, if I take my fist and I start to throw it at your face mm -hmm. and I never make contact with it, but you jerk back because you think I'm gonna hit you, that's an assault. If I follow through and I hit you, that's a battery. You don't charge somebody with assault and battery for doing the same swing. But if I threaten you with a knife, that's called aggravated assault or point a gun at you, that's aggravated assault. But if I point a gun at you and shoot you, you can, depending on the prosecutor, they can do what they call underlying crimes. They can add those things in there. But yeah, assault and battery are two different things. You can have an assault without having a battery, and you can actually have a battery without having the assault is a lesser included crime. So you never charge that other piece of the crime. It's all one crime. Okay. Well, I thought I'd throw it out there because I, th yeah. I felt like that might be another one that's commonly, he just assaulted me when you get hit in the head. <laughs> I know. Why were you offended? Yeah, you know. Yeah, but yeah, you're right. And but that's that's why it's called domestic battery. You know, so it's actually it's the physical laying upon of hands or the touching of somebody, you know, and stuff. And actually, you know, um, again, that goes back to and that's why these discussions are so important, because in this day and age, as technology moves so fast, we've really got to realize, step back, take a breath and realize words mean things. When we're talking about something, we've got to make sure we've got it in the proper context. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you and I end up talking past each other or you walk away with an assumption that says, oh, I was just assaulted and I'm going, well, he was just battered. You know, we have right. the same event, but we have two different versions of it. And then therefore, you know, what happens is we diverge like this and then we wonder why we're so off base on a project or on a on a trip or, you know, I thought you were doing this. Well, I thought you were doing this. And pretty soon the left hand and the right hand, they never talk. <laughs> well, and, and I do want to circle back to the uh, AI aspect of it. There's a lot of concerns now I have, and I think others have about, if you will, surveillance state, mm -hmm. but also as a programmer, I'm sure you believe in <laughs> garbage in, garbage out or gigo. Gigo. Yep. Well, do you recall there was a Microsoft? Wow, Microsoft's come up a lot in this conversation. <laughs> I never talk about Microsoft, but they were training a bot to be I know a what you're talking, yep. friendly Twitter character, and it turned into a Nazi within it, like hours. It learned, you know, it, it learned, it adapted its behavior, right? And then, and it, 
And you're right. And see, this is the thing that worries me about people say, you know, like uh, Terminator. Oh, that's that's not real. Skynet's not real. Well, I go back. If you remember, Isaac Asimov had the three rules of robotics. Mm -hmm. And you go back and you read those things and you go, man, you're you're right. You know, it's like we've got to is there there is a ethical consideration to this in terms of the use of AI and robotics and other stuff like that. One of the, when I used to write for The Hill, um, which is a publication, online publication out here in, in uh, D.C., right. but a lot of it, there's a lot of political stuff. That's why it's called The Hill. But I wrote about lethal autonomous weapon systems and the use of AI in those things. And I would never, so the military made a, the U.S. military made a conscious decision that there would always be a human in the loop. Mm. Machine learning gets you to a point to understand that, yep, that's a tank. That's the difference between a, a T-72 and a, you know, and a T-7 and a T-80 tank. So machine learning can tell you that. Artificial intelligence will tell you whether it's a threat or not. But there's always a human in the loop, whereas Russia and China, they're actually developing systems that would actually act autonomously and deliver the ordinance, deliver the payload without human intervention. And I think that's that that is the scary part for me is that when you have it's like talking about uh, global warming and I'm not going to get off I'm not going to take no, a position no, no. all I'm going to say is when you look at the facts of who the biggest polluters in the world are it's not the United States no. how do I get the country of China or India to change their entire behavior because that if you don't change that you can't change the rest of the world well it goes into AI and the use of AI by the way um, I, I will tell you, this is the thing that still chaps my uh, hiney here. Um, Project Maven out at DOD was going to be the use of machine learning and AI to go through and analyze predator drone video so we could do a better job of understanding the actions that were going on. And Google was involved in that. They said, well, we're not going to, you know, remember they backed out of the DOD project. Well, we're not going to be involved in things that kill people. Yet Google opened up an artificial intelligence center, center in China. And China has what they call civil military infusion. Everything that's developed in China eventually ends up making it into the military. They won't support the U.S. military, but they will support China doing the same thing, which means American-made artificial intelligence is now being developed in China, and it's going to be used in some of their – I guarantee you – and I talked – one of the discussions I had was Bob Work. Bob Work used to be the number two guy at the Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. He was the under, uh, or he was the uh, a deputy secretary of defense, the number two guy there. Him and I went out and had lunch one day, and we talked about stuff like this. And I will, he he know he's got he's got higher levels of classification than I ever had. It is being integrated into Chinese weapon systems. Our technology is in their weapon systems. Yeah, and that's all. That's always been a concern, like. We have had, to me, the most ironic situation where you have, and I'm going to, I'm jumping on Korea now because I think yep. Samsung and Apple are such a perfect example of, of the world trade economy as we have it. So you have Apple suing Samsung for ripping off the iPhone, which they blatantly did. Anybody who has a pair of eyes can say, yes, at least at one point when they were getting started, the Samsung yep. was cloning the iPhone. Everybody was really. But... The same company they're suing is building the microchips that are powering the device that's being copied by the company that they're suing. Do you see a crazy loop in here? Plus, it's a matter of some goofy trust because all they do is design the chip. They don't fab it. They don't do you know, yep. they'll, they'll make a couple examples and they say, okay, Samsung, now build this, but shh. Your, your right hand is not supposed to look at the left hand. And There's then supposed to be that, that firewall China. in there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and the Chinese no. firewall has got to be the biggest joke of a term in the world. And at well, Cisco, I'm sure you didn't have any. <laughs> well, let me tell you what happened when I was at Cisco is that um, Cisco is very anti-litigation. They don't want to litigate anything. In fact, by the way, do you know who owned the trademark for iPhone? Cisco. It was Cisco. Yeah. And they settled with Apple. And so when the initial iPhones were uh, – and I've got – I still have my original iPhone that I bought. I have it in a box down here. But when you go and look at the VPN client, it was a Cisco VPN client. That was a trade. You're going to put our VPN client on the phone, and we're going to let you have the trademark. We actually took Huawei to court. They had ripped off what was called our iOS, our uh, basically what we called our internet operating system. Oh, by the way, another, another name from Cisco that wound up in Apple, iOS iOS. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the Internet operating system. And but Huawei had copied it line for line, word for word, even mistake when there were spelling errors. They copied it mistake for mistake and they stole it and they ripped us off and they put it inside their routers. Well, it got to the point you couldn't do anything inside China. China was actually the number one counterfeiter in the U.S. when I was doing this work for Microsoft. Sure. Bill Gates came out one time and he said, look, 95 percent of the software in China, it's all pirated. 
You know, mm-hmm. there was there was no sense. There was no reason for them to continue to do business in China. Yeah, and Russia. So, and, and Russia. Actually, some of the cases I worked, I actually – the way I broke up the rings back in those days, this is 1999, 2000, the way I broke up these software piracy rings – was to actually go back to the e- the uh, email provider and say this is a violation of your terms of service because the only way they could contact at that time was through email. They say, hey, email me uh. here and we'll get you the stuff. So I'd say I represent Preston Gates and Ellis on behalf of Microsoft here, and I would call out their terms of service. You can't do this stuff, and that's how I would break the chain on a lot of these investigations is just use you know terms of service. But uh, Russia, China, but the the one that really worries me is China. Russia's good at espionage. Russia. Uh, we don't do a lot of work and development inside of Russia, so they don't have the same forced technology transfer that right. China does, right? But it, but again, I go back to um, so the, the example is the COVID virus. I, I mean, can do you really believe the Communist uh, Party of China, the Central Communist Party, the CCP, that since March first till now, and I was just on the COVID site before we came on, mm-hmm. that there's only been an additional 1,400 infections in one month in the entire country of China? Tested. That's absolutely. There's been that many tested. No. I, yeah. <laughs> so if you stop testing, you won't have infections. That's right. Hey, yeah. You know, that, that was actually the way we used to deal with crime. If you wanted to get more grant money, what you would do is and on one crime report, you could put multiple offenses. It'd be one report with three offenses. Mm-hmm. No, you do three separate reports. Oh, crime's just increased 300 percent. Then you get the money. You put all the offenses back on one report. Now crime has been reduced. That was a yeah, that was a, unfortunately a scam inside, you know, public safety for a long time. But that's, you know, that's the same thing with these guys. And I'm just telling you, it just um, this whole thing we've got to wake up and realize is that it, you were mentioning like Apple and other stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, look, I'm a patriot. I, I make no bones about this. I'm a cop at heart. You cut me. I bleed blue. I'm a patriot. You know, I served in sure. the military six years. My dad was a World War II and a Vietnam vet. I got tons of friends that are special operators, uh, oh, mili- yeah. you know, law enforcement. We've got to bring this stuff back home. We have to bring – I would be willing to pay more for my iPhone, more for my MacBook, more for my clothing. I would be willing to pay more now as we move the manufacturing out and either bring it back to another friendly country, go to Vietnam, go to India, go to anywhere Mexico. but China, Mexico, and start bringing the stuff back home. Start, And we should be doing a lot more, like you say, especially the fabrication, not just to the design but the fabrication of chips – a lot of that stuff ought to be going on here in the U.S. for national security reasons, but for economic reasons. And we're finding out, too, with COVID, 95 percent of the pharmaceuticals we need, guess what country they come China. from? It's the same country that produces fentanyl. It's the same mm-hmm. country that produced substandard uh, drywall that was uh, laced with all sorts of toxins. The same country that produced tainted baby formula. The same pr- country sure. that produced dog food that killed tens of thousands of animals, right? Because there's no quality control there, not like there is in the U.S. So we've got to uh, – and look – I don't care what you say. You can say I'm racist, homophobic. I'm not. I'm a patriot. I'm an American. The fact, you know, you're entitled to your uh, you're entitled to your opinion, but not your own facts. And so the facts are those are all facts. When you look at the when you look at the in fact, there is a 2016 article I have. And I'm trying to think where it came out of. I actually have it saved in Evernote. They actually predicted the next great pandemic would come out of China. And they described the reasons why. And this this wasn't a conspiracy theorist. Right. These were Nobel laureate types. These were, you know, uh, learned scholars. These were people who have been written up in peer-reviewed journals of the highest caliber, you know, uh, the Journal of Medicine and stuff like that. They were, and they were for exactly those reasons. So look where a lot of these pandemics, uh, epidemics have started. And there's there's a central focal point. We have to, from a national security standpoint, start shifting a lot of things and shift the balance of economic power. Well, I'd also push that I don't think it should be seen as racist automatically too because i haven't heard you say anything about japan no you're not saying japan is a but but they're asian so it's not like um you're really worried about a race or anything you're saying this country is a bad player it's a country it's russia is a bad player Uh, am i racist against russians no you know so um we we could do all this kind of stuff no it it is look the Part of my DNA is makeup as a cop, as a detective. You go where the facts lead you. Mm -hmm. My wife used to get so not angry at me, but she didn't quite understand our ability to compartmentalize things. I won't go into details, but we had a family member that suffered a nervous breakdown, was supposed to be headed to a Western state, um, didn't show up, was eventually found in a hospital. And everybody, obviously, the family's freaking out. I'm like, let me because I got friends at LAPD, LA Sheriff. I said, Let's just work this. Let's let's get the facts first before we start worrying about things. So I just worked through a series of facts, was able to make contact, got her dad out there. They picked him up from the airport, um, took him out there. But, you know, 
but when you just go from a fact, if you go where the evidence leads you, I'm telling you right now, China lied. People died over 35,000. Now they lied about when this started. In fact, I speak in a Cisco, one of my good friends, his daughter and son-in-law were teaching at the university of Wuhan. They were teaching English over at the university. When this stuff started all happening, I have the Facebook and the text messages with them as we're trying to help them get what the state department has, what they call the step program. But I had some contacts at the state department from some work I did the years ago, and I'm trying to help these guys make some mm -hmm. connections to get them out as soon as possible. I will tell you that this, this was the cover up, not just three weeks. The, the, I, it, it galls me to see the news media so carelessly gobbling up the propaganda that China's putting out. Now they're saying, well, we're sending masks here. We're doing this. That's blood money. They're trying to mm -hmm. change the narrative. This is influence operation. These are active measures. They're using they, – they don't let you use Twitter inside the country because they use Weibo, right? Um, or Google. Yeah. You can't even – try searching for Tiananmen Square, my friends. You can't. It doesn't mm -hmm. exist. But they will use Twitter outside to manipulate – they even tried to accuse the U.S. of saying it was one of your soldiers that came over the games that brought this. You know, I'm sorry. Screw you, buddy. Um, you know, let's – Let's not. But the problem is we have too many people repeating that as though it's gospel. Nobody's taking a critical look to say, when did this start? How long did this start? Um, there are competing theories. And I'm not a virologist uh, in an sure. immunologist. I have no idea whether this was made in the uh, this is a bioweapon. But what I will tell you is if you start looking at what dots are out there, the, the only level four bio lab on mainland China is in Wuhan. It's the Institute of Virology. Um, did they have all of these markets going on there? Yeah, where they have bats and pangolins and all of these other things, some gross stuff. There's videos out there showing them stuff. But when you start looking at these things, all of these mm. dots start. I have a theory on what happened, and I'd love to run it by you. Yeah, absolutely. Fire. Have you ever heard of Hanlon's razor? Uh, or like Occam's razor? Yeah, but it's called Hanlon's razor. And it's essentially no. um, never ascribed to malice, that which can be explained by stupidity. Stupidity. Uh, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yes, that's that's a I favorite saying of Unix administrators, too. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a I think Hanlon was a Unix guy, but um, <laughs> I'm a um, complete believer in that. Yeah. And my theory is that somebody working in the lab was around the stuff, whatever it is. I'm not going to say that they created it. Mm. They could have just been studying it. It could have jumped containment just through sheer stupid. Remember, we talked about quality control, lack of quality control. I can imagine somebody having something in their lab pocket and walking out and saying, oh, shoot. And they're just throwing it in the normal trash instead of the biohazard waste. The normal trash gets taken out for whatever it is. And it could be anything like a rat or anything else. It gets into that, runs over to the market, which is only meters away. And then suddenly it gets picked up into everything. Now, my theory is that the same thing probably has happened a thousand times before and nothing came of it. But it's that, but it's that typical. And look, I, yeah. I'm with you. Look, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I don't believe black helicopters are going to fly in. I, I don't believe in this whole martial law thing. Everybody, every now and then you'll see somebody say, they say, look at this picture. The UN is taking over because they have all these vehicles. Look, you idiot. If you just do a little due diligence and read the rest of the article, it's a shipment of trucks that are going to a port. Here they are on the port on the ship going out to sea because we're shipping them overseas. The UN is not coming in to evade, invade America. You didn't even think, how could they? I mean, how could they? You're they can't, they can't even. <laughs> you, I mean, could you even invade Ashburn, Virginia? Yeah, look, dude, you, you try it. There's still a lot of us out here who believe in um, uh, all of the amendments, not just the second. So <laughs> it's like it, it is it is very problematic. I mean, it would it's be... not going to it is not going to happen. Martial law is not going to happen. And I'll tell you why it's not going to happen, because there are 330 million people in the United States. There are less now because of covid. There are less than one million and actually only about 700,000 full time, not part time, but full time. Law enforcement officers. By the way, mm -hmm. a lot of people don't realize this too. A lot of people look at after 9-11 and New York was obviously attacked and NYPD had those devastating losses along with FDNY. Oh, yeah. You know, and so I asked people, I said, here's a question for you. Does New York City have more officers now or less officers after 9-11? Every oh well, they gotta have fewer. more officers. It's a, they have fewer. But by about seven thousand, seven thousand fewer mm -hmm. cops in New York after 9-11. Folks. This is this is what we call the thin blue line. In fact, you probably can't see it. You'll see a flag over here. I've got mm -hmm. uh, a, a thing back here. Look, um, I've got a good friend of mine. Uh, his name is on the wall. I mean, look, I, I just I believe in the thin sure. blue line, but thin blue line only works when there is an orderly society who believes in the rule of law and will ascribe to you know we, we're we're you know we are a nation of laws, right? Mm -hmm. When people start 
not just violating the laws, but ignoring the laws, ignoring things like the lockdown orders. Am I a big fan of that? No, at, at some point, there's going to be a tipping point. We haven't reached it yet. But at some point, is there too much of this stay at home of quarantine? Our governor, I think, um, overstepped a little bit. Today. Northam, telling of me till June, I was reading the comments on Twitter on a lot of these places called, you want insurrection, you know, as opposed to saying, look, we have what we will do is every two weeks. That's exactly. You should have just said, uh, we thought it would be this day, but we need to extend two more weeks. Yeah. Uh, oh, and look, okay. Or set the look, set the expectation for people. Every two weeks, we're going to do a review, and if we need to extend, we will. We will never go two weeks longer than what we absolutely need to do. But the state of June, you are just inviting now insurrection. I don't want to say insurrection; that's a bad word. You're inviting now social discourse or social disorder. You're inviting sure, yeah. people wanting to go out and violate the order because what they want to do is thumb their nose at the governor, as opposed to. I was just out before we got on. I went out. Very nice day up here in Northern Virginia, 75 degrees outside. I haven't been out on my bike in a while. I have a Peloton, so I ride a lot indoors, but I love sure. to get outdoors. But I, you know, I actually, my wife made me take two. I have two, uh, I have a whole back packet of wipes here. So I had to take two wipes with me just in case. I'm going down the trail. I see people still congregating together. Uh, and one guy, I'm coming up behind him and I was far enough back and I moved over, but he spit. And the, the wind is blowing like 15 miles an hour. And I'm like, I usually, I'm usually pretty chill on the, you know, I get, I love doing stuff mm. like this, but I'm pretty chill out there. But I'm like, you effing idiot, you just spit. Are you kidding me? Yeah. You know, because he didn't even look to see who was behind him. And I wouldn't, you know. Well, the thing is, he didn't even know. Uh, the odds are that he does it all the time. Same does it all the time. You have a vice president who will um, sneeze into his hand. In an interview. And Jake and Jake Tapper took him to task for that. <laughs> and he was like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm at home. Well, well I'm at home alone. <laughs> look, I even I even have – look, I've got my I, – I love my Tommy Bahamas. I'm a huge Tommy Bahama fan. Almost everything I own is Tommy Bahama. And as much as it pains me, but when we're out, I'll still – like you say, I'll cough into the – you cannot – do the hand. By the way, James Wood, I love his Twitter stuff because he's always sarcastic and he's got he's he's cut, you know, he's, he's good. Cutting. He's not even he's sarcastic. Cutting. No, he is he's, a brutal. I mean, he is like um, comparing a sledgehammer to a, a straightforward Twitter. That's automatic oh. controversy. And but he, he said we ought to we ought to. And it got me thinking. We ought you know why we ought to eliminate the handshake. Do you know why the handshake was originally created? What the purpose of the handshake was? You know, I. I do not remember. I've heard it before, but I don't remember. Something it goes back arms. to like the 11th century. It goes back to show that you do not have a broadsword in your hand. Right. We are still following ancient. We're still following a tradition from now. Don't get me wrong. It's kind of like we'll do the bro hug. You want to shake. It's like, guys, guess what? The world has changed. The world changed after 9-11. The world changed mm -hmm. after the 1918 flu. The world changed after. Look, I was a detective in Kansas when the Oklahoma City bombing happened. I worked with the FBI on it. My mom was actually the secretary at Fort Riley who processed both McVeigh and Nichols out of there. They built the bomb five mm -hmm. miles from my boyhood home. I had all of these connections to it. And it's look, it changed forever. How you bought fertilizer, how you, you know, how you did certain things. It, it viewed how we looked at people who stranger who come in and buy stuff. And it's like, you know, Here's some trivia on that, by the way, and I'm going to interrupt yep. for our friend Christopher Lockhead. It's the dark side of being a category king or queen. Yeah. Uh, because everybody knows that Timothy uh, McVeigh created a fertilizer bomb in a U-Haul, except it was a rider. It was a rider truck, and they rented it at <laughs> Martinez uh, Rider Truck Rental on Golden Belt Boulevard in Junction City, which was a mile from my mom's house. I know exactly where the place is. He stayed at the Dreamland Motel in Junction City. When this went on, they found video surveillance from one of the... But you're right, it was an info bomb, ammonia nitrate fuel oil. Mm -hmm. He researched on how to do this, parked the truck in front of the Murrah building, and then, boom, it blew up. Yep, and U-Haul forever owns it because they're the category king. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Like Coke, like, you know, Hertz and or stuff. McDonald's, was, yep. Or, yep. Or, or uh, what's the other one? It wasn't Kool-Aid. It was Flavor-Aid. Flavor-Aid, yeah. The Jim hey, by Jones the way, what's the, number, what's the number one wine in the world? Uh, Barefoot. Uh, Franzia, I think it was. But yeah, the number one distributor, seller of wine is Walmart. You know, or, oh, you know, distributor. Costco, okay. yeah. But, you know, people, but that's the, 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 the most popular restaurant in the world is McDonald's. It's not the best restaurant. It's, but to your point, they're a category king. They, they've they got more, you know, they've owned that space. And this is what happened with, so after, you know, so after 9-11, the problem is we've always fought the last war. We haven't, uh, and one of the projects, I worked on several good projects inside 
uh, the intelligence community and sit inside the Department of Justice and DHS on how to think differently about these problems. We were not thinking differently. In fact, um, I had to brief at that time. It was Deputy Attorney General uh, James was Comey. that with uh, and, Brad Meltzer in them? Was um, that part of that program? No, I was uh, no, not that. Okay. Um, I was actually on a program at uh, after 9/11. It was called Counterintelligence Field Activity Joint Counterintelligence Assessment Group. We created what's called Technology Exploration Development. It was how to take all of the dots, connect all of the dots, using massive computing resources so that we could identify risk out of all the thousands of dots. And then at, at DOJ, it was how to share information between 18,000 federal, tribal, state, and local law enforcement agencies. And one of the the, the lessons that came out of the 9-11 commission was, was a failure of imagination. The mm. problem with is the Hatfield, well, this is the way we've always done it. Guess what, guys? You, you keep doing what you've always done. You keep getting what you've always got, which is crap. You know, I, I had to fight the FBI. I had showed them how to connect serial killers together by use of it's a, I won't get into the inside baseball stuff, but every time a law enforcement officer stops you, they check to see if you're wanted nationally. And that's a system called NCIC, National Crime Information right, Center. right. Well, that inquiry goes into a static file. It's called the NCIC offline inquiry. It does you no good. I mean, I can use it if I know I'm looking for you. And I can right. go into the system and say, where were you on this date? Where were you on this date? But I have to, it's a math problem. You give me two and two, I can always figure out four. But how do you solve for the something a known, which we have, we know we have a crime with two unknowns? Well, I said, look, mm -hmm. every place in the United States Every agency has its version of an IP address. It's called an ORI, Originating Agency Number. It's a way to uniquely identify the agency. And I said, if we just go through and look at what the data tells us, this was the poor man's artificial intelligence and machine learning, because we know from a behavioral standpoint, serial killers committed low-level crimes, and they were picked up for low-level yeah. crimes, but we could never connect them between the different things. Well, I said, let's go in and use NCIC offline. Mine NCIC offline. I want to draw a circle around where a crime was committed in VICAP, violent criminal apprehension program where we know this is a crime that's connected to this crime. And let's look at all the things that are in common. Well, come to find out, we did that because of 9-11, the 19 hijackers, uh, Nawaf al-Hazmi, one of the key hijackers behind, besides Mohammed Atta, was stopped in April of 2001, written a ticket by the Oklahoma Highway Patrol, but he was put on a State Department watch list in August. Why would you put somebody on a watch list to keep them from coming in the country when they're already in the frickin' country? Because the State Department and the Department of Justice didn't collaborate on the sharing of these dots. Well, so we learned some lessons out of that. We learned some lessons on serial killers. Well, then guess what? Came the DC sniper case. And mm -hmm. I had done a whole, I actually have a whole analysis. It's unclassified now where I told them, I said, look, draw your, I went out to Morgantown, West Virginia, to the FBI Criminal Justice Information Services Division headquarters out there. And I said, guys, you're, you're missing an opportunity. Here's what it is. Their own Justice Department, Bureau of Justice Statistics, had done a study, and they knew how many people there were in the United States age 16 and older, how many had one, two, three, four, five, you know, multiple contacts with law enforcement. Well, the mm -hmm. more contacts you had, that became a very narrow subset. So I said, go through and draw circles around Prince William, Prince George's, Montgomery County, and start looking for the vehicles in common between that, because that was the thing. We were all looking for a white panel van out here, but it wasn't a white panel van. We were trying to find something. I said, well, the, it's it's in the unknown. So how do you solve for an unknown? Let's. So by the way, long story short, only 97 vehicles in the National Capital Region out here had their plates run two or more times. Out of those 97 vehicles, three were Chevy Caprices. One belonged to Malvo and Muhammad. We already had the vehicle. We had the oh, data. Wow. We just could not connect it back. We didn't do a job of connecting it back to those crimes. And guess what? It was the only vehicle in the United States whose tag was inquired upon by law enforcement nationally, not only in the National Capital Region, but down in Alabama, where there was another shooting linked through ballistics. A buddy of mine with ATF, Michael Bouchard, was the lead agent from ATF that ran the ballistics program. And another buddy of mine, Mitch Cunningham, was the uh, chief hostage negotiator for wow. Chief Moose in Montgomery County. So, I mean, I I'm invested in this stuff big time. And so I'm going, hey. We're missing the opportunity here. So again, it goes back to you. How do you solve for the unknown? Well, you got to start connecting these dots a different way. And so finally, one of the projects uh, I was I led on um, uh, in terms of the uh, winning the project and everything was consolidation of the terrorist watch list. Did you know at one time we had over 25 separate terrorist watch lists? Wow. So how do you, you know, we got to have one, guys. We got to have one, you know. So that's what we did. We were able to consolidate everything down into a single now, some people may argue with it. I, I don't care. You, 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 that's fine. Free country, First Amendment, as well as Second, Third, Fourth, and Fifth, all those good amendments. But guess what, guys? But at least it's one list that we can deal with now and understand when somebody gets mm -hmm. on there. We know who put them on there. There's no Nawaf al-Hazmi falling through the cracks where the State Department puts him on a watch list in August, but he's already in the country. And then him and 18 of his other 
uh, terrorist buddies hijacked planes. And uh, by the way, I drove past them that morning because I had a meeting in the Reagan building. We're supposed to be in the Pentagon. We were moved to the Reagan building. And I drove wow. past the hijackers that morning going into D.C. Good Lord. Well, like in all fantastic interviews, we're leaving with more questions than we got answers. So I'd love to. What I do is I bring back really fascinating guests that I know that my audience will want to ask questions for onto my live stream. And sure. I want to invite you and see if you'd be up for doing that. Absolutely. Anytime. Look, I'll, I'll even do my hair for you again. You know, try Ooh. and look pretty, like you said, you know. Somebody in this conversation has to look good. <laughs> <laughs> You've got that covered. But thank you so much for coming on. You bet, man. Absolutely.